Tom Macero, Great American Mining. Excellent. Thank you for joining the program here today. We got a few things on the docket, on the plate, on the menu here today with Tom Macero, Great American Mining, which does a lot of Bitcoin mining out in the Bakken. They've tried it in some other places as well, depending on the heat index. I'll let Tom talk a little bit about that. But first of all, uh, how's things going with you there, good sir? Well, uh, strangely well for being uh, 2020. Um, You know, I think a lot of us uh, in this particular field in oil and gas, as well as even in Bitcoin, We've, uh, you know, faced the, the lows of this year and then all the other craziness that we had to overcome along with, you know, folks in the, in the oil and gas industry. And, and now, you know, there's a little signs of life. Uh, Bitcoin price is an uh, inch close to an all-time high, close to uh, $20,000. Um, oil is starting to creep up a little bit. And, uh, you know, there's signs of life out there with producers who are, starting to think a little differently in terms of how to maximize uh, every dollar out of their molecules that they have. So we're, yeah, we're excited to go into 2021 uh, and we're just excited to get out of 2020. That's for sure. You said Bitcoin is up to an all time high or near all time high. Yeah, I think it uh, was up to around 19.5 yesterday. Uh, all time high is just uh, right around $20,000. So uh, yeah, it's um, had quite the, late summer um kind of ramp up and uh you know i think one of the articles i sent you uh, maybe last week sometime uh, there was a city bank analyst who uh essentially came out and um, predicted that they foresee a bitcoin price in the next year or two of uh three hundred and twenty one thousand dollars per bitcoin from fifteen twenty thousand correct well, that's, yeah, that, put, that, that, that it, seems a little bit ridiculous, doesn't it? It does. Uh, but like the, the interesting thing about the way Bitcoin works is it's, it is a controlled um, distribution of, of the Bitcoin or of the production of Bitcoin. So there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin ever made. Right now in circulation, there's approximately 18 million. Um, so that means that there will only ever be 3 million Bitcoin uh, minted here in the next, I don't know, hundred years or so. What? Why only um, twenty-one million? Yes, the creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, when he originally designed or dreamt up this monetary system, was based on the fact of all of these central banks and uh, it, it kind of inflation getting into all of our lives, like we're seeing right now. He saw the financial meltdown of two thousand eight and said he wanted to create a deflationary um, monetary system. And so in that, I would say, like concoction of trying to right the wrongs of of the modern banking system, he created a deflationary um, um, monetary system. And so in that sense, the because it is capped in terms of supply, like, for example, we just keep printing dollars right now. Eventually, maybe one could even say right now that there will be a devaluation due to all of the printing that's taking place because it's not backed by anything. Um, Bitcoin, we know because of the computer algorithm, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin ever printed. Okay, so So just let me me pause one second here. Yes, sir. Um, What prevents more Bitcoin from being printed because there was a time when the Federal Reserve said, we're not going to print any more money. And and they went ahead. I mean, Japan's on QE infinity. Now they've done it so many times, they actually call it infinity. So um, that to me would be the biggest question is uh, what makes Bitcoin so definitive that once it gets to 21 million, it then stops? Because if that's the case, that's fantastic. Yeah, Jason, I love your inquisitive questions because you you ask important questions that that lead to the most important truths. And the reason why these things are different is the central bank or uh, in, you know Japan in that instance. There are men in gray suits who decide these um, decisions arbitrarily at their own whim, or in most cases, um, at you know for their own expense or for their own. Um, I would say at our expense for their own gain. 
in Bitcoin, we are all, when I say we, anyone who is uh, partaking in this network by having mining uh, equipment or nodes that essentially all interact with this network, we are the enforcers of the software that is running. And so no one can make that change um, in and of ourselves. No, there's not one entity that can come in and say, hey, we're going to we're going to make this change. Um, and that's what's beautiful about it, because all of this mining equipment that, you know, you're starting to hear about um, on, on these uh, oil and gas fields, this is all going to protect this network. And it's reinforcing the rules that are already in place. And it would take a very, very big change in terms of, of, of how something like that could get changed um, based on, you know, it, it almost have to be sentiment within uh, all of the miners and people using Bitcoin to advocate for this. Um, obviously, if we keep continue to see the value continue to go up and up and up, that is the last thing we want um, to have happen is to have our money now devalued because it's not the now remember. It's our money now. If you own a Bitcoin, it's yours. It's not in a it's not in a bank collecting interest. In fact, they own your money when it's in a bank. So um, you know the onus is on us. All the owners of Bitcoin, we that's we, we protect our own network, and um, and I think that particular use case will become more and more important uh, in the coming years. So circling back to oil and gas and how it's relevant out in the oil fields because. There's, there might be some people listening to this that is like, what What now? How Oil yeah. and gas, Bitcoin, mining, you know, all these different terms and things along those lines. So if, if you're the, the very layman's, I guess, definition would be you, you are redirecting flared gas to uh, mine Bitcoin, which then has a tangible value out in the marketplace through Bitcoin. Now, I didn't know there was only 3 million left to be, you know, printed and, 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 and a number of different things like that. So that does make each Bitcoin that's mined significantly uh, more valuable in my mind. That's a great, yeah, absolutely. And one of the other things to, to think about is the initial bull run of uh, 2016 into 2017, where it reached its all time high of $20,000. That, that happened in the end of, yeah, beginning of, I'm sorry, end of 2016, uh, right around December. That's when, you know, that, that particular high was met. Few people remember, though, that the initial run, uh, bull run, started when that Bitcoin price was around $2,000. So we had a 10x, um, you know, jump within three or four months of, of that price. So... The idea that we could hit, um, and then prior to that, there have been other jumps in Bitcoin. You know, originally, I think back in 2013, it reached a high of like four or $500. People initially got interested in it. Well, it went from $15 to that. Um, so it, it has these, um, because of the way it's, I would set up from a, a mathematics standpoint, you'll, it's not unheard of to see very large multiple jump. So if we reach its equilibrium, which is kind of where it's at right now, took a couple of years to kind of equalize back to like the price range that it's at right now, um, a 10 X jump from here would be uh, 200,000. Um, so it's, it's not that out of the ordinary in, in terms of what it's done historically. What's well, interesting. I mean, because at the end of the day, it's, it's being treated like a commodity, correct? Right. And you know what? That's why we've, um, we, we just recently launched, I don't think I've mentioned this. Uh, we just recently launched a new website at uh, Great American Mining, which but, is G-A-M. But, by the way, that was my number one thing that we were going to talk about, but we transitioned right away into what we're talking about that we never did get to it. So let's just reset here for a second because sure, sure. Um, one of the other reason besides the Bitcoin mining and the, and and how oil and gas companies can make some money and have some opportunity in the Bitcoin market and uh, have a reduction in their their uh, flaring and redirecting some of their methane gases, et cetera, which we'll get back to in just a second. But uh, Thomas Arrow and Great American Mining Company, they have a brand new website, which is, again, 
another reason for the news behind this particular interview and story with Tom Macero. And what is that website address? And then transition into describing some of the changes and features you have at the website. There, how's that for an official question? Excellent, excellent tee up there. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yes, uh, our website is www.gam.ai for Great American Mining. And the one big change on the website is that we have launched what we believe is the first in the industry, a uh, a, a calculator for oil and gas uh, producers and mineral rights holders to plug in certain values into their ca- this calculator, and it will tell them how much money they would make if they were mining Bitcoin with their gas. And so um, this is based on data that what we've learned in the past year and a half, uh, mining Bitcoin off of uh, flare and, and trap gas. And we want to be able to now have uh, those tools be put in the, the hands of um, you know uh, producers and mineral rights holders. You're up in the Bakken, right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. And That's uh, our best place. You were down. You are or were down in the Permian, but there's some differences of temperature and gases and that sort of thing. Talk to me about uh, some of the shale plays you're in and some of the obstacles and successes you're having in the different shale plays. Yeah, I would say uh, most of the Bitcoin mining that's taking place on oil and gas uh, pads are are taking place primarily in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, you know, we've got North Dakota doing stuff in the uh, Colorado, Wyoming area as well. They work really well with the, um, so when we say, in order to give someone a visual of, of what these things look like, I know that you posted a video uh, fr- uh, back from us uh, when we first started talking. I think you called it Bitcoin After Dark in the in the Bakken. Um it's just a 20-foot shipping uh, container, a Connex box, that we've essentially retrofitted to become a uh, massive power uh, conductive um, data center. Um, and so we have a satellite system that works in conjunction with this. But these machines that are in this mini data center uh, draw a lot of power. And so we have generators that run uh, specifically on a lot of these well pads for their um you know, for the for their power on the pad, we then use that same um, genset configuration and power these uh, mini data centers off them, and and that's where we're at right now. They run off of um, their air cooled fans, so typically the climates in you know these the northern hemisphere allow us to run 24 7 365 all year round uh, in these environments. Unfortunately, we cannot run these same containers the same way down in texas there isn't anyone to my knowledge who is running them at least at scale uh down there so there's a number of us who are experimenting with other cooling related technologies to 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 be able to do what we're doing uh in the texas heat uh do it in a way where they don't break down they can run they can be essentially autonomous where there doesn't need to be a lot of uh, hand-holding going on on the technical side either. Canada has been doing quite a bit of the Bitcoin mining, too. You mentioned the Northern Hemisphere, and just to yes, sir. validate it's uh, gone you know, into the international um, waters or lands as well. Uh, have you, has the state of North Dakota, the state of Wyoming, the state of uh, Colorado, you mentioned those three states, um, have you been in discussion with them? Have they looked at this as a potential for, you know, putting one out there as an ancillary for one of these oil and gas companies, maybe to, you know, get some tax money? I don't know. I'm just, any conversations with states on uh, working together? You know, we've had some preliminary conversations with states, but I think after, you know, the crash back this spring, I think a lot of states just were, you know, kind of hunkered down, um, and just trying to make sure that they could, you know, deal with their own, um, you know, budget shortfalls and things like that, where, you know, the conversations we were having prior to the crash, uh, were much more fruitful. Now we're literally just working directly with producers where we say, Hey, um, if you've got trapped gas, you don't have a way to get it to market, you know, via a pipeline, or there isn't any collection, um, or gathering, uh, lines, we'll come in, we'll buy the gas from you. 
um, where they wouldn't be getting anything uh, in return normally. And that would be going against their, you know, their mandated flaring cap. So uh, that's the, the route that we're taking right now. Um, and like I said, on the calculator that we have on the site, it's a very simple form. You literally, uh, for so for an oil and gas producer, they would fill out, okay, how many um, MCFD on a daily basis, you know, are you flaring on a particular pad? You know, I could uh, punch in 200 MCFD. Uh, what is the BTU per scuff? Uh, so, you know, typical is around 1500. And then what is your current net back? And then that's basically whatever their margin or their net is on the gas that they sell. So it won't be, you know, 220 or $2.25, which is what, you know, or somewhere in that range, which is what the Henry Hub pricing would be. It would be whatever they get back after all the fees and, you know, when they get paid. And so uh, when you run that calculation, uh, we then show you how much money you would be making uh, or losing versus just sending it back into the pipeline. And um, just for you know, a quick uh, kind of idea of, of the value of that gas when it's turned into Bitcoin um, at a, uh, let's see, at a 50 cent net back, uh, you're looking at $11.50 per MMBTU or in an MCF range, you think you're, that same gas is worth $17.25 in MCF when it's converted into Bitcoin. So, you know, I, that, we believe that more open we are about the capitalistic nature of Bitcoin mining, that we will see more investment in the space, particularly from producers who are going to look at this as a alternative, not just an alternative for flare mitigation, but ultimately a revenue generating uh, profit center. How about the geopolitical side of Bitcoining when it comes to oil and gas? And the reason I bring that up is Iran, Venezuela, you know, they get brought up a lot of times as the big boogeyman and that sort of thing. And I was just reading an article a few weeks ago about Iran is going to start selling their Bitcoin to the Central Bank of Iran or something like that. And, and, and right away I was like going, you know, I wonder what the whole political angle is with Bitcoin, if there is even a political side, if it takes it right out or if it actually allows, you know, ISIS to be a player. I'm, I don't know. I'm just just throwing things out there from the worst case scenario. Um, talk to me about the geopolitical and the politics or the lack of involving Bitcoin and oil and gas and that whole marketplace. Yeah, great, great question. So th there's two angles here I think I'd like to touch. Um, recently, there was a uh, an article in the Washington Examiner. I'll, I'll send you the link here after the call, uh, where Trump's top director of national intelligence, John Rat Ratcliffe, wrote a letter to the SEC chairman this week uh, pointing out his concerns with China's sway or, um, uh, I would say, influence over digital currency. He then goes on to point out that more than half of the world's cryptocurrency mining operations are located in that country and how the Chinese government is mulling its own state-controlled digital currency that would make it tough for U.S.-based companies and innovations to compete. So uh, to answer your question, absolutely, um, geo the geopolitical um, angle is very important. And more so in the last year have we seen more open conversations around uh, these uh, particular issues. And, you know, this was just posted uh, yesterday um, and, and then we, we, there was another story about a week or so ago where the SEC is uh, developing new rules for banking systems, or, or maybe not for banking systems, banking policies uh, specifically to lessen the uh, ability for, Jason, you've mentioned in the past that activists have targeted oil and gas companies on the financial side, whether it's blacklisting them from banks or uh, doing shareholder activism. And that's been a big issue and an issue that uh, isn't going away. Uh, just last week, I noticed uh, an article where the SEC is developing a rule set that will essentially guard the oil and gas industry um, from predatory banking uh, activism, as well as another industry the cryptocurrency industry 
from the same type of behavior. So uh, it's very interesting parallels that uh, are taking place um, with these two, and we just happen to be right in the middle of them. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you about the uh, ESG, the environmental social governance uh, side of the banking pressure that's been put on, which, which is really, it's here. And I don't think people understand that um, it's this movement is, is, is the new normal in banking and in investing. And unless, unless there's a quick change the other way, it just seems like that's how it is. So it's nice to know that alternatives are starting to not only be, become more um, viable, but they're also becoming more advantageous. It sounds like that um, there's, I mean, I was just looking at Bitcoin the last month. Holy smokes, 13,000 to 20,000 in a month. Like, yeah, it's pretty wild. It, it is. And, you know, and I right away I thought, boy, is this going to be one of those gold and silver type things? You know, I mean, that when sometimes when the hot hand goes, it goes for a while. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And I think a lot of it has to do with people's, it, you know, just like anything else, um, it's very much a, a confidence uh, game. And so right now, all of the momentum is fleeing potential assets that our investors have less confidence in. And over time, you know, the, basically the longer Bitcoins, every day that Bitcoin survives and the it, it continues to become validated uh, based on, you know, its premise that it's a secure digital uh, cat, you know, basically it's a digital transaction uh, that allows people just like you and me, no middleman to uh, engage in these transactions every day that it's live and continues to run where it doesn't get hacked or, or, you know, someone can't arbitrarily um, add, you know, 50 million into it. Uh, it be, it's, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, um, you know, some of these legacy systems where you can just see the walls crumbling down more and more money leaves those pools, whether it's real estate or bonds and stocks or whatever it is, and they slowly creep in. It's kind of like, uh, gravitational pull pulls them into um, Bitcoin, and it you're le- you're right in the gold and silver analogy because it's a form of digital gold in a sense. So people who like the monetary aspects of gold um, really like the, you know how uh, Bitcoin is in terms of like it being the digital form of gold. Well, the fact that there's a cap on it, which I didn't know until this interview, by the way, that there was a set cap on it. Um, I, I just thought there was a value and then, oh, okay, well, it's at 20,000. So 20,000 more people bought it, 20 more thousand. Now there's that many more Bitcoins out in the marketplace. So I didn't realize that you guys are essentially are mining for Bitcoin. And every one that gets mined is just another one closer to that end goal. And once the end goal is there, then, then what? What happens after 21 million Bitcoins are mined? Yeah, so they'll just go on and produce, um, you know, like the miners that will. Now, this isn't supposed to happen till like, I believe, the year 2133 or something like that. Uh, so it's you, know, you and I will be long gone, so we won't have to answer that question. But uh, many people believe that the value of the entire Bitcoin network will be so lo- uh, large that the mining that will be that will be taking place, like it is right now, will be used. Um, how they'll make money is off transaction fees of people, uh, you know, buying and selling Bitcoin to each other, and that's how the network will continue because the value of the overall network will be so high. Um, that there will be an incentive on the transaction fees um, where, you know, you've got your 21 million. Now, remember, this 21 million is uh, broken down, I believe, into 16 decimal points. So you do not have to own one Bitcoin. You can own a fraction of a Bitcoin, and that can all be traded and bought and sold um, at any time you want. So... Although there's 21 million Bitcoin, it's you know divisible and can be traded in in, in such in terms of um, the amount of you know percentages on how much you want to send and whatnot. Okay, well that, that makes more sense because I I was doing a uh, kind of a news search to see you know what was going on with the Bitcoin world and oil and gas and 
20 hours ago, there was a guy that put out an, an article in, in one of the, I forget which respected journal it was, but it was, you know, one of the financial papers saying that everybody should have 3% of their net worth or their income invested in Bitcoin. And I thought, okay, if these are the conversations that they're going to start having, because what do they say? A certain percentage in real estate, a certain percentage in precious metals, you know, that sort of thing. So if Bitcoin is now starting to be float, you know, starting to float out there as part of your balanced, diverse portfolio, I, I, I didn't, I thought that might speed up the 3 million is all, you know, that, that we, maybe we will see the 3 million bot in our lifetime, but it sounds like if there can buy one sixteenth of it, then it'll take a while. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I got what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So the way that the algorithm works is that, uh, and that's what we're, when we talk about mining Bitcoin, it, this falls into that purview. We, uh, for every 10 minutes, there is what is called a block reward that is rewarded um, uh, through the algorithm. So um, every 10 minutes, six Bitcoin are rewarded to some of the miners that are out there that help solve the, you know, the puzzle that keeps this whole thing um, secure. And that is how new Bitcoin are entered into the system. And then every four years, what happens, they call this thing the happening. Now your listeners are getting a, I would say like a pretty advanced, um, dosage of kind of all things bitcoin most people take bitcoin in small doses at the beginning because it is there is a a lot in terms of to kind of wrap your head around it took me a number of years from first hearing about it to thinking this is uh, this is kind of silly i don't understand it um till years and years later you know kind of where certain components of why it was designed became much more clear to me and um the halving is an interesting component because this actually slows down the dis- the new distribution. So this past May was uh, the halving. In May of 2024, there will be another halving. At what at that point, instead of six Bitcoin being distributed every 10 minutes, it'll drop to three, and then in another four years, it'll drop to one and a half, and then in a- another four years, it will drop to um, you know, a half of that and, you know, continually do that programmatically all the way to that 133 or, you know, uh, 2133 year. So there's no possible way for those 3 million Bitcoin that have yet to be, um, you know, sent into the system as like new supply. It cannot enter into the system, um, you know, just on its own. Like there, it's timed that the way they'll be distrib- distributed. All right, well, I still got one more advanced question for you because I pulled up, you know, some of the <clears throat> stories about Bitcoin and that sort of thing. And Sure. I love how, you know, a lot of times they'll say, like, you know, stocks to buy, and it'll say basically weed, Bitcoin, and oil and gas. And I'm going, boy, I, I didn't know you could lump all three of those together, but okay, we'll, yeah. we'll take a look at that. And it, Anyways, but um, the one... Headline, it said that a Bitcoin shortage was driving the price above 19000 And I didn't even know what Bitcoin shortage meant outside of yep. some sort of sensationalism in the headline. So what, what does that mean, Bitcoin shortage? That's, you're, you're, touching on all the, you're touching on all the right points, Jason. Because Bitcoin has a capped supply, that means that uh, the shortage is that there isn't an infinite amount of Bitcoin for people to buy. So more people are holding on to the Bitcoin they own. Thus, the people who the, the, the people who want to buy uh, outstrips the people who want to sell. So now the price continues to rise um, as that's the case. And so within like the last three or four months, there's been a number of very large publicly traded institutions. There's a publicly traded company called MicroStrategy. Um, that bought, I want to say between four and six hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin with their um, their cash reserves that they had on hand, and that uh, investment, I believe, they bought at around ten thousand dollars. So they've already seen a doubling of their money since then. And then a uh, another public traded company, uh, Square, you know, the, uh, the where you slide your credit card in if you're a local local coffee shop, they. Uh, 
they invested $50 million in Bitcoin off of their balance sheet as well because they believed it was a better investment than holding cash. Um, so uh, when you have that much Bitcoin that's removed off of the, uh, I guess, like, you know, the market for people who would normally be buying and trading it, um, that causes uh, the price to jump because there just isn't enough supply um, to, to deal with the, uh, the demand. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, you know what's funny is I've I've uh, when I've gotten done chatting with you in the past, and I'll I'll talk to the guys about like oh yeah, what'd you chat with Jason about? Because it's always like you you know like it's like I'm 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 like teaching you in a way, you know, and uh, it's great because we're we're always talking to people that already know this stuff, and one of the things I always say I forget because I like to talk about the censorship resistant component of it is the is the com- component that we touched on today, which is this cap on it, which, you know, now it made this like light bulb go off with you. Cause it's like, Oh, this makes things much more dif- different with uh, this system. Well, it, to me, it, it just, again, if you look at it like gold, you look at it like silver, you look at it like oil, cause oil is a commodity now. Cause most of the wild ca- caddying is, is all but gone to, to precision horizontal drilling and fracking. And, um, hydraulic fracking. So when I look at this, I look at it from a mining standpoint. And if you knew the end goal, well, that totally changes things. That, mm-hmm. that, that makes things completely different. I mean, all of a sudden now, the supply and demand, um, it's like nothing we've ever seen in terms of real life. So I don't know. It's interesting. It's it's a little, little bit of video game, a little bit of real life. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else to look at it, I guess. I, I like that term, a little bit of a video game, a little bit of real life. I well, like I'm just picturing all these kids playing Minecraft, you know, and sitting there doing their mining, and all of a sudden they find a diamond, and it's like, hey, look at this. We got our diamond, except for it's real, like if that's yeah. what you actually did. And, you know, we do that in real life with carrots and potatoes and oil and gold and silver and <laughs> A commodity is a commodity at the end of the day. So just trying to figure out how Bitcoin became a commodity. See, I was going the whole different direction of, I thought this was a currency for a long time. And even though I was told it's not a currency, but it is, that I didn't wrap my mind around it because my argument was always, well, as soon as Amazon takes it and you get into ATMs, it'll take off. But that's not the case with gold and silver and oil. And do you know what I mean that's by right. that? That's right. Absolutely. So I, I think, is, it, is that kind of maybe what, what some people are missing the boat on? Is they, they look at it like, you know, it's, it's a new MasterCard or Visa or a new, you know, yen, ruble, whatever. Is that, do you think the average person looks at it in that way? Yeah, and I don't necessarily think they're wrong. I think what they're doing is they're looking at one particular uh, or a couple of particular attributes of digital currency and, and Bitcoin being specific here. And they'll say, Oh yeah, this is just a digital currency. And that's very, it's limiting the, uh, the, the real, I would say identity of what it is. And I think the further people, and you know, even our conversations are, if people go back and listen to when we first started chatting about this back in April, Jason, uh, they'll see, um, you know, like different components of what makes Bitcoin special. And uh, you've been able to articulate it and then slowly develop a more complete view of kind of its inherent features and characteristics that separate it from just specifically being a currency. All right. So let's, let's bring her home here as we're at about 35 minutes on the interview. So Let's, let's go back to how the oil and gas companies can benefit from this. And for you entrepreneurs, keep, keep listening because you're going to figure out probably some other way that's very similar because this template is, is very good. And the template, again, I'm going to give the very layman, but you describe it like I'm some sort of operator you're trying to do the pitch to, which is you, you are redirecting flared gas, which is very much – in the news now by states stepping up yep. and trying to become more uh, governance when it comes to and, and, and government when it comes to controlling the amount of, of uh, flared gas. So 
you're redirecting flared gas to be captured essentially and then mined and converted into Bitcoin through operating some some um, big fans and computers and it's basically a big giant generator type of a looking thing right at the well site. So uh, yep. take the baton, correct me, add on and give the pitch, but I wanted to give the very dumbed down version of it first. Yeah, I mean, you know, we agree. Like, what we love about now, mind you, we could can we could mine Bitcoin in a big warehouse next to a power plant, next to a big substation, in probably a hundred different locations in the United States. Uh, the reason why we're tackling the the problem from the angle that we are is that uh, we believe in the long run that oil and gas producers will be the most incentivized to do exactly what we're doing right now. So we want to be early um, to this game. And then secondarily, though, the problem that we're solving isn't just being able to mine Bitcoin at um, competitive rates and from in terms of like how cheap we can um, produce electricity. The, the, the bigger component to us um, is the um, environmental stewardship that really aligns with being able to do with deal with wasted gas in the in the form of flare gas that is a massive nuisance and right now is a a, a wasted opportunity of value not only for producers but also for uh, the mineral rights holders and the land uh, rights owner holders as well as the public that would get some of that tax revenue that literally is just going becoming you know methane and being burnt into the air there's no need for that and so we're providing an economic um, channel for wasted flare gas that we believe that uh, oil and gas producers can get much more value than they would get if they were to even wait for a pipeline uh, to send their gas into. All right. What's that website again? And how can people get in touch with you? Brand new website. Well, not brand new. It's a, a revamped website, new look. It's the same old website in terms of the address. Uh, g- give us the deets and uh, how can people get in touch with you, et cetera. Yeah, thanks, Jason. You can go to www.gam.ai, and that's for Great American Mining, and uh, all of the uh, there's a big blue Get in Touch button uh, right on the website, and that will eventually get, get over to one of us. Um, and feel free to play with that uh, mining calculator that we just put in there for uh, gas volumes. Uh, there is a we have a, a nice feature on there too that allows uh, you to share that individual page that you you know developed your own calculation on to share it within your company or or you know other colleagues as well. So uh, we're excited to get feedback on that too, and we just really appreciate the time, Jason. <laughs>